Hello everybody, my name is Ilya. And my name is Tyler. Together we make up Kavre, a couple that loves to play board games. And Canada. Maple syrup, eh? Maple Valley, maybe. Oh! Today we're doing a Kickstarter preview of the brand new... Maple Valley! Maple Valley. Maple Valley is published by KTBG, it's designed by Roberta Taylor, and the art is done by Shauna J.C. Tenney. Now following the cold winter that you prepared for in Creature Comforts, it is now the spring, and with the spring comes a spring festival. What better way to celebrate than to bring together all the wonderful animals and put on a great celebration? In this game what you'll do is you'll collect friends and go out and forage to find the best favors so that your team of friends can be the most successful and bring the best to the community festival. And you know, I'll do the other people because it's a competition everybody. Will you do better? Maybe. And last but certainly not least, what you see here today is a prototype of this game. So the final product may look differently. You'll have to check out the Kickstarter campaign down below for all the final versions. And if there's any notes or changes, we'll make sure to note them in the comments down below. Well, with all that out of the way, let's take a look at how to play the game. As always, you'll begin by setting up. You'll place the game board at the center of the table. You'll shuffle the outpost cards and deal one to each of the outpost locations. Then you'll shuffle and deal three festivity cards above the game board, blocking out spaces based on the player count. You will then prepare the favor, patch, and friends deck. You'll shuffle and create a display of four face-up cards for each. Then you'll shuffle and place a Doddle deck near the friend deck. On the map, you'll place six black and white curiosity tiles randomly on their matching trail spaces and flip them face up. You'll do the same for the growth tokens. First, distributing the ones matching the leaves, aspen, maple, and oak, flipping them face up once all the tokens have been placed. Then you'll place the general tokens randomly in the remaining spots. As you flip up the general tokens, if spaces ever match, you'll swap out the general token with the one extra that was left over. You'll then shuffle the sun tiles. You'll draw the sun from the stack and place it on the leftmost position. This good is the sun's good. You'll then prepare the supply with the goods, curiosity, and map tokens. For the player setup, you'll pick a player color and take the pack, pawn, player markers in the starting friend of your color. You'll place the player markers in your pack and your pawn in the village. You'll proceed by drawing one random friend from the deck and adding them to your hand, along with your starting friend. You'll draw two random favors from the deck and place them face up to the left of your pack. These are your favors you're currently preparing. You're now ready to begin. This game is played over five rounds, called Hours. Each turn you'll play a card from your hand until you run out of cards. At this point you pass, when everyone passes the round ends. Now your turn comprises of four steps. Play a card, travel, activate your location, and complete favors. Let's go over each of these steps. When playing a card, you'll place the card from your hand into the tired friend space of your pack. The card you play will determine which trails you may travel across. And many friends have various special abilities you can utilize as well. You may instead play a Doddle card here. You'll simply gain anything on the card and proceed to step 4, skipping the travel and activating locations. Now the second step is traveling. Your friend will have travel types listed on the card. You may select one of those and move your pawn along the trail, location to location, traveling as many trail legs of the correct type as you want. A couple notes here. You may not backtrack on trails already traveled this turn. And if you travel across a curiosity site, you'll gain the corresponding token. Now before and or after you use your friend's travel type, you may use a map token to travel one trail leg of any type per map used. You may use as many map tokens as you have. Now the only location you may choose not to travel in is the village. You may instead choose to stay and activate the village. All other locations you must travel in if you have played a friend card. Now let's talk about activating your location. When you are done all your movement, you may activate the location your pawn occupies. Let's go over each of them. Groves. When you are at a grove, you may forage for goods. When you forage, you may collect one of each type of goods or two of one type. Now, if you collect a good matching the sun good, you'll collect an additional good of that type. The village is where you make friends. You may make one friend by spending curiosities. Spend the curiosities listed on the friend you want and tuck them behind your tired pile. They may not be used until the next turn. The lookout gives you two maps and one favor of your choice on the display. 
The clubhouse allows you to collect one favor from the deck, add one of your player markers to a favor spot on any festivity, and collect one patch of your choice from the display. Now you may keep up to four patches below your board. If you ever gain a fifth, you'll discard one of the patches to make space. Each patch describes its effect. Some may be activated once per turn, while others can affect endgame scoring. The Lodge will allow you to collect one favor from the deck and one favor of your choice on the display. Now there's two outposts in the game. Outposts vary game to game and generally provide a market and an effect. Each outpost provides a number of trades it is willing to make with you. You may make any of these trades in any order. Trades are unlimited unless a card indicates otherwise. Now following the trades, you may use the outpost's effect. Last, the bluffs give you the ability to collect three sun goods and then immediately zoom to the village. You may then activate the village as if you've traveled there normally. And that's all the locations. You may use friend abilities throughout your actions. They generally only take effect if they take a specific action on your turn. If they don't describe a specific timing, then they may be used at any point. The last step is completing favors. If you have the correct resources to complete any of your unfinished favors, you may spend those resources to complete them now. Favor cards are kept in the bringing side of your board. Some favors have bonus scoring conditions that encourage you to collect sets of favors. Each favor also displays a category on the top left. When completing the favor, if any festivity has an empty favor spot of that category, choose one such spot and place one of your own player markers there. Each festivity will provide points at the end of the game, with the player with the majority of tokens obtaining extra points. They will also provide an event. If you place the final marker in a particular festivity, you will trigger the event below. At the end of the round, you will advance the sun, cycle the card displays, discarding the card furthest from the deck and drawing a new one, and refresh your friends and patches. Then you'll compare how many friends you have. Everyone except the player or players with the most friends will draw dawdle cards until all players have the same amount of cards in their hand. You'll pass the first player token and you're ready to start the next round. You'll keep playing until the fifth round has ended and now you're ready to score. You'll calculate your final score from favors, including the bonus scoring. Now some favors will allow you to score resources on the card for bonus scoring. You may move resources between your favors and pack freely, but each resource may only be used once to score one card. You'll also add up points from your friends and patches and score your leftovers. Honey and Maps will score one point each, while everything else scores one point for each group of three resources. Finally, you'll score festivities. Each player will receive one point per marker on the festivity, the player with the most markers will receive an extra 3 points, while second place will receive an extra 1 point. Once final scoring is complete, the player with the highest score wins. Will your team of friends bring the most joy to the Spring Festival? I would hope it would be joyous. Joy. No matter what you bring. I hope it's a jar of fireflies. Well, let's kick it off and dive right on in. Let's start off with the theme of the game. Cozy, cozy creatures, cozy, cozy creatures. Cozy, cozy creatures. That's all you need to know. I love that you're making friends throughout this whole process. Yes. Because you start off with one friend, but then as the game continues, you just build friends and it's such, it really feels community driven, which is what it's all about. Yeah, I, I, I think I like that a lot. It, it, it really kind of connects, well, this probably leads into our other point, but we'll get there. But by collecting more friends, you increase your hand size, mm -hmm. increase your ability to be able to do things. And I think that's a very like clever thematic way to uh, tie it to the mechanics of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And there's so many different animals that do all these different things. I mean, they've ke kept it to like the river, the forest and the, um, I guess, plains. Uh, I can't remember the third name of the terrain type. It's mud. Ah, <laughs> yummy. <laughs> I don't know if it's mud. <laughs> but there are three. So mm -hmm. uh, there's different animals and they're all from different places and then they can connect that way. But you don't always need to have just one type of uh, critter. You can have multiple. Well, it's very thematic in the sense of you are really foraging. You're going to the different groves. But then sometimes you come back to the buildings and be like, here's what I have. 
Should I get a riskless resource? How do I, like, what recipe do I need to find? Mm -hmm. What badge do I want to have to kind of go with that whole scale theme? I think there's a lot of really elements that really interconnect and play together and in general, it just feels thematic the entire experience. Mm -hmm. And of course you have to end the, you have to like try to get back home because mm -hmm. they'll get more benefits. People will be more interested in what you're doing and that's, a, that's really the easiest spots. And, and you'll build more of friends. The spots, yeah, to get friends. So, so <laughs> you gotta join people to the cause. And be like, hey, we need to get these fireflies. Exactly. How are we gonna build the lantern? Come on. Yeah. Last thing I'll say too is I like the curiosities element of it. I like that they separated the resources and curiosities, oh, yeah. Yeah. because as you travel, you'll get these curiosities, and that's generally what gets the friends' attention. Be like, hey, I've been there, and this was curious. I wonder what else we can find here. And I, I like those little nods really, they sell, they make my heart happy, so. Yeah, it is really cool. It's like two different resources, but you do end up using them for the same type mm -hmm. of thing. Um, majority of the time, I think you're only spending curiosities to get creatures, mm -hmm. fr friends, but um, those curiosities can also be used to build other things, and that's uh, a lot of fun. Yeah. But I guess that leads into our next point, which would be the mechanics of the mm -hmm. game. Mechanics. Yeah. And the big driver for Maple Valley would definitely, in my opinion, have to be hand management. Uh, you really want to make sure you're grabbing the right people, the right creatures to join your cause, because they'll provide unique abilities, which is always nice, but they'll also allow you to move in different areas, and you want to be uh, cautious of that, because you want to spread yourself out almost evenly um, in most instances. So, well, you don't want to get stuck. Yeah, exactly. So your starter friend has all the three, but the other ones are very catered. So you want to make sure you have some flexibility to move around how you want to move around. Mm -hmm. What I like too, which I have not seen in hand management deck builder games, is there's almost this like catch up mechanic where if you, at the end of each round, you compare how many friends you have. And if you have the most, you get to keep them, but everyone else gets to draw doddle cards. And up to the highest. Up to the highest. So everyone has the same amount of cards at the end of each round, which makes sense because then you take the same amount of turns the following round. But the doll cards aren't great because all you get is resources and you can complete your favors, but you get to miss out on that essential movement and activating location. So all of a sudden, if you haven't really been prioritizing getting friends, you're like, I really need to get friends because I don't want these doll cards because they don't do as much for me. Mm -hmm. But it still gives you something to do at a time where maybe you could, you wouldn't have done anything. Yeah, it's like an alternative to having to say pass on your turn when there's nothing left for you to do. So then you can kind of just still join in on what's going on. Uh, although you'll just like take your turn by playing that card and doing whatever it says on it. <laughs> exactly. The last thing I'll add to is a set collection. I love the way the set collection is done here because not only are you saving resources to buy a specific favor, there's elements on each of the favors that allow for bonus scoring. Yeah. So you want to collect one favor, but then you want to collect the adjacent favor that goes with it to get more points. So then all of a sudden it ties in thematically as well, because this bundle is worth more points than rather having these three sets of favors by themselves. Yep, exactly. Uh, the badges also add an interesting mm -hmm. uh, appeal to the game where you can maybe get different resources, maybe accumulate more resources, mm -hmm. or score yourself points for later on. So that adds to that set collection piece because, for example, the one that comes to mind is number of creatures that are from the river. You can get river more creatures. points for that. Now, that's a give and take because you do want to be cautious about not just having no. river folk. Tyler just wants to collect all the otters. Correct. I do. The last, I just add to the set collection piece though, uh, the cool thing is, is like Ilya said, is there's this circular thing, uh, but there's also things that are, where you can actually utilize the resources mm -hmm. that you have left over uh, by using them and scoring yourself more points. And that's always nice. Yay points. And of course, there's also elements of festivities too, where you can add to the festivities, trigger additional events. There's a lot that really flow together quite well mm -hmm. to make, your, make you want to come back again and again in order to experience the different elements of the game. Mm -hmm. So with that information overload, <laughs> the game essentially gives you these chances to optimize your strategy and give you these opportunities to go into different directions depending on what comes up, depending on the events that are occurring and anything really that's on the board. It's really for you to decide how you want to play your game and sometimes it could be a lot of fun having to readjust that strategy based on what comes up 
based on what other players are taking, and just deciding that your strategy might not be the greatest. <laughs> It's definitely a factor of adaptability because there's different merit badges, there's different people, there's different favors. If something comes up and you're like, this makes sense, I need to connect these dots, but then someone takes it, yeah. you have to keep adjusting, you have to grab the resources. And I love that in games because it really creates opportunities to learn as yourself as well, to be on your feet, to know, hey, I need to shift here because clearly collecting all the river folk is not working, I'm trapped. No, that's not what I'm gonna do. Yeah, exactly. Well, probably the biggest thing on people's mind when they they hear about Maple Valley is how does it compare to Creature Comforts? And, well, they're set in the same world, mm -hmm. which is a bonus for a lot of people who are already familiar with the Creature Comforts uh, realm. Mm -hmm. They've done this in such a way that it feels almost natural to move into this game where they've only shifted the, mecha the major mechanic of dice worker placement to hand management and resource management essentially. Uh, but the resource management feels very, very similar uh, between Maple Valley and Creature Comforts, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. The way that you collect things, the way that you pay for things, the way that you score extra points, those are all integrated into Maple Valley. And because of that seamless transition in mechanics and art and the world that they've created, Maple Valley felt pretty easy to pick up. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate the competition element of this game because obviously it is a competitive game. You're competing with one to five different players, but it still feels like you're working towards the same purpose where I didn't feel that as much in Creature Comforts because everyone's just like creating their own little getting ready for the winter. Right. Here, you're all celebrating the Spring Festival and it's all bringing different elements and different favors to make this as much of a community event as you can. So although you are competing, you're working towards a very common purpose where all of you can celebrate together. And I like that. It's a little thematic touch that just makes it, makes the competition a little less harsh. Yeah, I think that's a good way to look at it because yeah, in Creature Comforts, it's more winter based and you're preparing mm -hmm. yourself for everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. Maple Valley, you're, you made it through. Mm -hmm. And let's celebrate together, why not? And my overall thoughts for the comparison between the two is that they, they have the scoring mechanic of set collection that I really like for the bonus scoring and the resource scoring and the layering of those opportunities. But they're both set with different core mechanics. Here being hand management and kind of that route planning of where are you gonna go, uh, not quite pick up and deliver, but more of going around and picking stuff up. Uh, where the other one is more based around the dice placement, work replacement. So if these mechanics appeal more to you, or if you want a little bit more of a variety uh, in your set collection, then definitely check out Maple Valley. Mm -hmm. All this to say that Maple Valley and Creature Comforts, although they are from the same world, are very different games. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for a, in my opinion, a bit of a lighter game, Maple Valley might be for you. Worker placement, uh, if you're a worker place for placement fanatic, then Creature Comforts is probably the way you'll lean, mm -hmm. uh, but both have earned a spot on our shelf. Yeah. But don't take our word for it completely. Check out the Kickstarter in the comments down below for yourself and take a look, ask those questions. We're also happy to answer anything that you may have around the game based on our experience. Just drop a comment down below. We're happy to chat Maple Valley, especially because yeah. we're in Canada. Yeah. Except I don't think we have any maple trees nearby. Um, no, they're all usually on the east side. The east side. Where we are not. Shucks. Ah, uh, shucks. <laughs> well, thank you so much for watching our video for our question of the day. Potluck. Potluck. Let's make it about potlucks. <laughs> if you are going to a potluck, you get invited to a potluck and you have to bring an item. What is that item? For the first thought that came into my mind is I make these Oreo balls. Oh yeah. With white chocolate. And they're just like a sugar overload. They're so they sweet, are. but they're so good. Cause basically like crushed Oreos, cream cheese, and white chocolate. And it's delicious. <laughs> Three ingredients. I no. feel like you just like devour them immediately, but it's super yummy. Yeah, I think I'd probably bring my muffins or I would make some. What kind, kind of, of muffins are they? Huh? The, well, it depends on the season. I would probably bring like in the spring, it would probably be my banana cinnamon muffins, but, um, yeah. What salad would you make? 
Probably like a potato salad, because that would be fun. Potato salad is the best salad. Mm, food. Is potato a uh, salad? I don't know. What is, what? What? <laughs> Anyways, what are you gonna bring to the potluck and why? Well, thank you so much for watching our video. Hit that thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, do all the wonderful YouTube things because they really help and support us. Mm -hmm. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Exactly, until next time, have a wonderful day.